now we know, 40 years later, that people like Fernando come at certain times in baseball history. He was an immigrant like many of the members of our families. He's not just a, a symbol to the Latino community, but he's a great pitcher. Like Jackie Robinson, Fernando broke a glass ceiling. Jerry Royce had been named the opening day starter for the Dodgers in 1981, but when he turned an ankle late in spring training, manager Tommy Lasorda turned to a 20-year-old rookie from Mexico, from Sonora. Fernando Valenzuela made it look easy. He shut out the Houston Astros on five hits, two to nothing. On this day, April 9, 1981, Fernando Mania was born. In the press, the stands, in Chavez Ravine, and all over Los Angeles. 1981 was a magical season for the lefty. He won the National League Cy Young Award and the Rookie of the Year, and helped the Dodgers beat the New York Yankees in the World Series four games to two. Fernando's impact on the Dodgers was huge, but that impact extended far beyond baseball. LA Latinos had someone to root for, finally, a reflection of themselves, and help them forget, or at least forgive a little bit, the events of three decades earlier. Back then, members of the communities of Palo Verde, Bishop, and La Loma, just north of downtown in Chavez Ravine, were forced from their homes. This happened after the government declared eminent domain in order to build public housing. The plan failed, but a few years later, that land was used as bait to bring the Brooklyn Dodgers into Los Angeles. Over the course of the 2021 baseball season, the Los Angeles Times will present Fernando Mania at 40. This video series will recount Valenzuela's incredible rookie season, of course, but more crucially, we'll relive the perfect storm in Los Angeles that had been building for decades that set the stage for Fernando Valenzuela's improbable rise. Here's a preview of what you'll see. The Dodgers came across as big robber barons. They took over this land, and, and the stories of, of families being pushed out of their homes uh, and a lot of bad stuff kept coming up. To me, it was, it was just a big black eye uh, uh, in society. You know, it, was, it, was, it caused a lot of pain. Because of that, you know, a lot of the Mexican-Americans, they, they, they said, hey, forget the Dodgers, we're done. We're not gonna go. We're never gonna step a foot in, in the new stadium. When Mr. Walter Mali came to Los Angeles, he used to tell us, Jaime, when are you going to find and give us a Mexican Sandy Koufax? And I used to tell Mr. Amari, it's impossible to find another Koufax, not only in Mexico, any Latin country. So uh, he, he wanted to have, you know, he realized that it was very, very important to please the Mexican community in Southern California. All of a sudden, along comes Fernando right out of the blue, just changed everything. When Fernando hit, it was just like, oh my God. <laughs> Here he is, man, here's a Mexicano. You know, everybody loves a hero. Everybody wants to have a hero. Willie Mays, Hank Aaron. I mean, everybody wants to be the fan of somebody. Uh, and especially if he's of your, your, your racial uh, background, my God, you know, vamonos, viva la, viva la raza, you know? So that's what Fernando brought. He brought an awareness and made us a little bit more prideful. He made the Dodgers seem more relevant to all communities. It was easier to forget about people being shoved out of their homes when Fernando was winning games. That's, that's a very shallow statement, but I think it's true. Fernando was really key in bringing the hearts and minds of La Raza back to the stadium or to the stadium really for the first time. When Fernando made it big, a lot of that, the guilt, a lot of that anger kind of dissipated and people start coming back to, to Chavez Ravine. Fernando Mania just exploded. I mean, all of a sudden, everybody had to be at the Dodgers when Fernando, wherever he traveled throughout the United States. It became, you had to go to the game. And, and, and literally, when the police would stop you, if Fernando was playing, they wouldn't say, what are you doing? They go, why aren't you at the park? You know, because <laughs> you were doing something wrong if you weren't at the baseball park. It was like, uh, watching Midnight Mass on Christmas Eve, or, you know, it's hushed, sit, nobody talk, nobody move. Today, we're pulling for the Mexican with Dodger blue on. But Dad, we have our Giants hats on. Shut up, put those away. It was 
quite a vibe, okay? I remember my my aunt, my tia Felipa, who loved the Dodgers and loved baseball, and she would always tune in to the Spanish language radio and then watch it on TV. She was so excited about Fernando. And I think that that's the same kind of sense and feeling that everyone had in the community. It was just an abundance of pride and a, and a sense of feeling like he was part of your family. When Fernando was pitching, was a sell out. Then at home, I know that ladies, especially, especially mothers and, and, and grandmothers, started praying and, and praying the rosary because Fernando was, was pitching that day. So uh, he became God, really, in Southern California. It was unbelievable. I remember driving home from uh, rehearsal one evening, right? And the Dodgers are playing. I remember turning on my block, my windows are down. And you could hear every TV. You could hear the TVs. Everybody's on Channel 11, I believe it was, watching the Dodgers play, whoever it was. And you could just hear, you know, this enthusiasm of people, because you know, Fernando was pitching. I always loved the windup. When he was looking at this guy who was looking at the heavens, for, at God, for inspiration, for that little bit extra kick. You are now there to see one person the person that reflects you, right? The person that speaks for you in some way, right? There's something I think about always about sports that has a character who is subversive, right? He's going to flip the whole script on what you've known or what you believe this sport to be. And this one seems more extreme because he's not tall, he's not blonde, he's not, you know, he's not Steve Garvey, right? He was chubby. And, you know, in, in, in Spanish we say gordito. He was a chubby guy, and, and the people could relate to him. I mean, he wasn't cut up, you know, and, you know, weightlifter, athlete's body. He was a gordito, just, just like everybody else in, in East L.A. We really didn't know anything about him, and we never, and we wouldn't for years and years afterwards because he didn't speak English. It was, you know, he was the kind of thing, you know, it was just what you saw was what you got, but what you saw was just sensational. Even 19-year-old, you got to be impressed with Fernando, that age, that composed, he have a demand. At that time, Fernando looked like he was in the major league for about 10 years, the way he, he handled himself. It was a phenomenon unlike anything that I had seen up until that time. And even though pitchers from other countries came in and there was a lot of tension put to them, I don't think it had quite the same impact as it did in 1981 with Fernando. It was the right person, the right time with the right story, and everything seemed to break uh, to present a whole new era of Los Angeles baseball. There was an optimism, hope, and energy around that that I think excited folks. Uh, the fact that, like Jackie Robinson, he also played at a very high level, kind of demonstrated to people, hey, there's talent in many communities. When Fernando was with us, uh, he's never gotten the credit that he deserves for the impact he made on baseball, not just on the Dodger organization, but on Mexican baseball, base, international baseball, the community. I believe that Fernando will always be a hero to the Mexican-American community. People love him. To this day, they love him. It's an L.A. story. I honestly believe that it's part of the history of Los Angeles. That's the impact that he had, not just on the Latino community, you know, but on Los Angeles. When he came in, he was like the guy. So all of a sudden, you have this sports figure who's not just a sports figure. He's a symbol of how you endure. Fernando Valenzuela was born in 1960 in the small town of Echoaquila, Sonora, Mexico. He was the youngest of 12 children and inherited a love of baseball from his father, Avelino, a farmer. In Mexico, they, they, they play a lot, of, a lot of baseball, you know, and my brothers, older than me, they, they play ball. So that's the reason, you know, I'm, I'm follow this game. His background was so, it was so crazy, you know, he was born and raised in a little town where his, his family had a little hut, basically a dirt floor, but it was just so improbable. Here's this kid from, from nowhere who became a superstar overnight, and it was just such a crazy, insane story. Dirt. 
<laughs> it's dirt, you see dirt, more dirt and more dirt. Uh, when he came in, uh, the, the, whole, the whole population was like 250. Valenzuela turned pro in 1977, pitching for teams at the Mexican Central League and Mexican Baseball League. We used to travel down to play the Norte Sonora, Douglas, Arizona, Agua Prieta, which is the other side of the border, Tecate, Yuma, San Luis. Fernando was pitching down there in, 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 those, in those leagues. So almost 16 years old, that's when I signed my first professional contract. And um, from that point, um, I told myself, well, now it's a career, it's not uh, just for fun. The Dodger scout in Mexico was Mike Brito. Everyone knew Mike Brito. You know who Mike Brito is if you're a Dodgers fan. He's a guy who always stands behind home plate with a big hat, the radar gun, and the cigar. I was a lucky day. In 1978, I went to Silao, Guanajuato, Mexico, to see a shortstop named Ali Uskanga. By the fifth inning, they make a change and bring, uh, bring a Fernando to pitch. Fernando was amazing. He never showed any fray when he was on the mound. He never got rattled at anything, even in life. Fernando pitched like nobody believed it. he was 17. They, they all think Fernando was older than that. I thought it would be fun and interesting to go to Mexico. I'd read about the Mexican League, and I thought, why don't I go down there and do some stories? So I went to the ballpark in Mexico City. I was waiting outside for a pass or a ticket or whatever, and I saw a guy, and somehow we started a conversation. It turned out to be Mike Brito. And we started talking, and he told me that he worked for the Dodgers, and he was telling me all about this guy, Fernando. He said, you got to see this guy. He's amazing. He throws curveballs, and it, in Mexico City is mile high. It's like Denver, thin air, so it's not a curveball city. But Fernando could snap off curveball, curveballs in, in the thin air of Mexico City. So Brito was really fired up about this kid. The cost to purchase Valenzuela's contract was $120,000. That was a fairly substantial price for a Mexican ball player in 1979. Fernando was happy we were going to sign him. He agreed, sure, he was happy. Everybody wanted to play for the Dodgers. Mike Brito uh, had talked about it a lot, that someday, someday, we're going to have a great player from Mexico. Mike's enthusiasm, and Mike's a very enthusiastic guy, his enthusiasm made an impression on all of us in the organization that we must do everything possible to sign Fernando. Yeah, that was uh, 79 when I was uh, got signed by the Dodgers, and then really uh, Mike Brio, he's the one uh, make the contact with uh, my team in Mexico, and, and they decide, you know, to um, to send me to uh, to minor leagues with the Dodgers, and so make me happy, you know, to um, to be part of the um, one uh, big league organization. Soon after Brito signed Valenzuela, he was assigned to the team's high A affiliate in Lodi, California. Late in the season, Dodgers general manager Al Campana sent the scout to assess the pitcher's progress. He got a good ball. He didn't, he didn't have the screw ball yet. So Al Campana told me, well, make a report what you saw and bring it to me. So I make a report and my report said that the fastball didn't improve. I told Al Campana, Chief, I think Fernando gonna need another pitch to survive in the big league because the fastball didn't improve. Like what, Campana said. I said, maybe a split finger or maybe the screwball. I think if he come out with another pitch, he's gonna, he gonna be a, a, a good winning pitcher in the big league. 79, that's when I went uh, to a structural league in Arizona. That's when Bobby Castillo was out there and helped me out how to grip the ball for the uh, just a little turn and screwball. What they tell me is it's gonna be easy for you because because uh, it's natural for left-handers, the ball move away from the right-handed hitters. So if you give it some little rotation, I think that's gonna be more effective. And I remember I asked Bobo, I said, Bobo, what do you think of Fernando? He said, man, I'm surprised. I said, why? He said, I'm surprised because Fernando picked it up right away. He was not afraid to apply and use it because that's the only way to know, to find out if the screwball are working, if Fernando make it work for him, and he had a lot of success as a pitcher. I remember writing that, that he, he learned it in about the 10 minutes it took Bobby Castillo to show it to him. 
So he had no trouble picking it up. Now, no, it's, you know, it's not anything that anybody else throws because it, it is hard to throw. But he did, and it was, and it was great. That screwball wasn't just that important itself. It's also because it set up all of his other pitches as they all came out from his arm angle and arm speed, all looking the same. Having quickly mastered the screwball, Valenzuela made an immediate impression in his first spring training with the Dodgers in 1980. I saw him in spring training in 1980 when I got a gift trip to Vero Beach for my 15th birthday. And I was so impressed with his control because the Dodgers had these strings lined up in their bullpen, have that strike zone, you know, defined. And you can see Fernando just in that zone all the time. And, uh, his delivery was so cool, you know, look up in the sky and do the high leg kick. And, but he was also kind of playful because he's such a great athlete that he made it look like, no, I'm just playing catch and throwing strikes. The homesick pitcher was having a tougher time connecting with his future teammates, though. He was very close to his father, I mean, to his whole family in Mexico. And he really missed his family. When we first came to spring training, he was a really shy, really timid, you know? And I remember, one day, I saw Fernando, he was so lonely, you know, homesick. And after practice, I said about three o'clock, after he finished work, my wife supposed to arrive in Miami with two of my kids. That was in the spring break. And I said, hey, Fernando, how about I go out for a ride? And Fernando went down with me to Miami to meet my family, because I want to keep him company, you know? And I want him to feel good, to feel like home and for him to express himself about how he was feeling about being in spring training for the first time. Valenzuela spent most of the 1980 season at Double A San Antonio, leading the Texas League in strikeouts. He earned a call-up to the Dodgers when rosters expanded in September 1980. Be honest with you, I want to stay in, in, in San Antonio because if we in the playoff, we, uh, we're looking for one more win to be a champion in the Texas League. And I don't say selfish, but uh, personally, you know, I say, well, this is my chance to be in a, in a big league, so why not go on, go on with, the, with the big team? There was definitely some buzz about Fernando when he made his first quick appearance uh, with the Dodgers. He pitched in a couple of games. In fact, he did quite well and opened some eyes about the possibilities for next season. No one was really expecting him to come on the scene and blast on the scene the way he did. I didn't see a whole lot as far as velocity which is what a lot of people measured back then. In this particular case, it was deception. And hitters must have had a tough time seeing him because he made it look awfully easy. Dusty Baker, Rick Monday, Yeager, they don't move me to the side. They say, hey, you part of the team, you with us. So that's giving you a lot of confidence. It wasn't all that big at the time, but it was, it was the next year that everything, you know, really just exploded. Fernando Valenzuela was born in Mexico, but his story is forever linked to the land upon which Dodger Stadium sits, Chavez Ravine. Pre-stadium, the ravine was populated with 1,800 mostly Latino families in three rural neighborhoods, La Loma, Bishop, and Palo Verde, just an eyelash from rapidly urbanizing downtown LA. But in 1950, the city got caught up in the national public housing craze. It acquired Chavez Ravine land by eminent domain and forced residents to sell their property, often below market value. Those who didn't want to leave were pushed out against their will. Chavez Ravine was uh, 300 acres of kind of like country living, very rural. There were dirt roads. They had their own school. They had their own grocery store. They had their own church. It was their own happy poor man Shangri-La there. The people just loved living there. We had relatives that lived in Palo Verde, in the Chavez Ravine area. You reach a certain point over a, a a SEMA, we call it, over an outlook point, you could see downtown LA. You could actually see them when they were building the Pasadena Freeway. And all of a sudden, they get a letter. Hey, everybody has got to move out. We want to do LA uh, public housing. Housing Authority wants to come in and take over. You know, everybody, the outside people decided that Chavez Ravine was a, a slum. It was a blight to society and uh, they decided that for the people. It became the object of um, folks that worked at the LA City Housing Authority for a, uh, a swell place for public housing, fantastical kind of communal living and 
high rises and modernistic designs. There was a six or $7,000 check for your home if you were the owner of it. And for some, like the Arechiga family, there was just no way, no, no rhyme, no reason to be moved. They would have to be removed, kicking and screaming, and by God, that, that would happen on national television. They bulldozed all their houses. It, it, to me, it was, a, it was a shame. When I was growing up, I had a very def definitive connection of what the history of Chavez Ravine was. You know, it's very much embedded in the Chicano psyche. That kind of tormented, you know, relationship of land and place. You have relatives who live here, right? Um, in the ravine still. Most of the families were Spanish speaking and they didn't have an understanding of what eminent domain was. And of course, everybody told them it was for the better good of public housing and so on. I had uh, three staff people that had lived in, in Chavez Ravine. One who was still extremely bitter about what happened during that time, who still would not go to a game because of Chavez Ravine. By the mid 50s, a changing political climate in LA put the kibosh on the public housing idea, but it was too late for the families forced to relocate. Evictions continued as the land was designated by the local government for public use. Then, in 1957, when Brooklyn Dodgers owner Walter O'Malley wanted to move his team, he made a deal with the city to develop the ravine as the Dodgers' new home. The Dodgers came to town the following year, playing their first four season in the cavernous LA Memorial Coliseum. The last residents of Chavez Ravine were evicted in 1959. Dodger Stadium opened in 1962. LA's Latino community would never forget. The bitterness and uh, kind of the mythic lore of this notion that the Dodgers uh, kicked out all the poor people uh, to build a stadium. It's not exactly the timeline that we spent a lot of time unpacking carefully. It was a housing plan for the poor, well-intentioned, but mired in suspicion and a hundred million dollars from the feds. Usually when a city is expanding and, and things like eminent domain are used, it's, it's, it's usually 99.9% .9 of the time, poor people are going to pay. So that bitterness is easily overlaid and transferred, you know, over to the Dodgers, fair or unfair. When you met some of the old timers back in the middle 60s that were from the Alpine area, Chinatown area, they all had a grudge against the Dodgers because they still remembered the fact that they got moved out of their houses, promised better housing, and it never developed, it never materialized. Oh, you know, O'Malley's bringing the Dodgers to LA. So we thought basically they were gonna rebuild or, you know, uh, revamp the Wrigley Field spot. Eventually, we got wind that they were going to, it, it was a shady move, really, you know, it's a deal done in a back room somewhere. The Dodgers, came across as big robber barons. They took over this land, and the stories of, of families being pushed out of their homes, a lot of bad stuff kept coming up. And my dad was a heavy equipment operator for the Department of Water and Power. And so one of his assignments, uh, after they cleared it out, was to put in the drainage and sewer systems. My dad was really reluctant, you know, because we had family there, and and it really, uh, it did not set well with him and uh, his crew as well. They were gonna refuse to work on the project. And my dad's foreman told him, don't do that because you could eventually end up losing your job. How much sick time do you have? And so my dad, you know, he had accrued a lot of hours of sick time, so that's what they did. They got about eight months worth of uh, time off the project went on and they knew that. And uh, within eight months, my dad was reassigned to do the uh, Pomona Freeway drainage and sewer system. To me, it was, it was just a, a, a big black eye uh, uh, society. And it, was, it, it caused a lot of pain. Because of that, you know, a lot of the Mexican Americans, they, bought, they, they said, hey, forget the Dodgers, we're done. We're done with them. You know, we don't care if there's Koufax and Drysdale. Maury Wills, Duke Snyder, we don't care. You know, we're, we're not gonna go. We're, we're never gonna step a, a foot in, in the new stadium. You know, there, it was a lot of pain, and, and there still is to this day. For some, there will never be a return. For others, again, the beating heart of Fernando Valenzuela brings many into the stadium and into the fold 
for the first time. The Dodgers are known for the Koufax Jewish heart and they're known for the Jackie African-American heart. We, we were never really a part of that picture until, until Fernando. Long before the Dodgers came to town, baseball was a big part of the Latino cultural fabric in Los Angeles. Weekend games were ritual events that brought communities together. A welcome antidote to the struggles of daily life. It was basically two religions. They literally on Sundays would, would go to church and then they would, after church, go home. S sometimes they directly go to the ballpark. It is not a recreational event. It is not a game. It is a place where, where Mexican-Americans come together as a community event. They would have mariachis that would be played. They would have Mexican food that would be sold. There would be political speeches that would be given before the game. For two, three hours, it was, it was a, a, a place of asylum where Mexican-Americans could separate themselves from all the racism and discrimination and xenophobia that they confronted all the other times of the day. It wasn't an even playing field in those days. You know, we were always struggling. It was very palpable and, and acceptable back then, you know, and, and we just accepted it, you know. Uh, we never knew we had it so bad. I grew up in South Central Los Angeles, a very cosmopolitan area. We used to call it the East Siders. The trolley system brought us together. Watts, Compton, Long Beach. And we kind of grew up colorblind because the neighborhood that I grew up in was an industrial neighborhood. So there was German, Irish, Filipino, Japanese, Russian, Orthodox Jews, Blacks, and of course, Mexican Americans. It's very mixed. I played at the local parks, kept us out of trouble. We had a Wrigley Field. Our thing was every Friday, Saturday, going to Wrigley Field to see the Hollywood stars and the Los Angeles Angels. The Dodgers became the new home team when they relocated from Brooklyn in 1958. The team played its games in the LA Coliseum while Dodger Stadium was being built at Chavez Ravine. I went to Elysian Heights Grammar School. And uh, what we used to do was we, we would cut school. But I don't think they call it cutting then. I think we just didn't make it to school. <laughs> and. Uh, and we would you know, climb over the hill and, and uh, we were watching Dodger Stadium being built. It was just awesome to know that like history was being made. You know, we were getting like a, a major league baseball team. My first game was in May of 1958 at the Coliseum and I just became hooked on baseball. I've always gone to Dodger games. I've gone to um, the last 44 consecutive opening games. It's a family tradition. Last year we had to wait outside the gate because they wouldn't let us in, but Technically, we were there. Dodger Stadium's 1962 opening was celebrated as a transformational moment in the city's history. I remember when it opened, it was like the biggest thing that ever happened in Los Angeles. I mean, it was all, there were almost parades going up there. We grew up going to Dodger Stadium. We grew up because I was, uh, you know, that first generation of um, Mexicans that were trying to assimilate into American culture. So this was a huge, huge investment in that culture. You know, where those infamous people that sit up on the top, the cheapest seats, right? So that was a big part of our lives. But many Angelinos weren't ready to root for the Dodgers, especially those impacted by the city's decision to clear residents out of Chavez Ravine. For the Dodger games, it was all people with suits. It wasn't for the neighborhood people that they uh, came and took the, their property from. When the Dodgers came, started playing in 1962 at, in Chavez Ravine, I didn't have anybody to root for, you know, during the Koufax, the Drysdale years, Maury Wills. You know, I mean, I, I loved the team, but there was nobody I could identify with. The complexion of the team was uh, mostly white and black. Very few uh, Latinos back then. Uh, the same with the fan base. It wasn't a large Latino fan base. When Mr. Walter Mali came to Los Angeles, he used to tell us, Jaime, when are you going to find and give us a Mexican Sandy Koufax? And I used to tell Mr. Amari, it's impossible to find another Koufax. He realized that it was very, very important to please the Mexican community in Southern California because he knew that they were going to come to the ballpark. In 1968, Vicente Romo became the first Dodger officially born in Mexico. Unofficially, it was a guy named Phil Ortega who pitched for the team for parts of five seasons starting in 1960. You know, Walter O'Malley was a, in, in many ways a very brilliant person in, in, in terms of understanding demographic changes, 
When he took control over the Dodgers in Brooklyn, he stacked the Dodgers with almost all Italian ballplayers. When you take a look at the Dodger lineup in the 1940s and 1950s, most of the players are Italian because he understood that New York was a, a very large Italian population. You had to have your baseball team sort of reflect the demographics of, of the community there. And so when the Dodgers moved out, uh, O'Malley carried on this, this business model, this business strategy. Yeah, Mr. O'Malley wanted to have a really a, a Mexican player doing well with the Dodgers. And, and we couldn't find, we couldn't find anyone. Suddenly, here, uh, here comes this uh, Mexican, it was a Mexican, <laughs> Filomeno Ortega. He was actually uh, from Arizona, and he was actually uh, Native American. But the Dodgers kept on promoting him as being Mexican-American. And, um, you know, Mexican-Americans uh, know a Mexican-American, you know? And so at first, it was a very bad start for the Dodgers. I always liked Phil Ortega because he was dark. He was as dark as I was. He was one of the very few Dodgers who had my skin color. And that's why I liked him. That's why I loved him, because he actually looked like me. It is Hollywood after all. Just, you know, you just, just say you're Latino, you know? It's like, if Eli Wallach can play a, a, an Indian, you can play a Mexican. By the 60s, the Dodgers were almost all African-Americans. Johnny Roseboro, Charlie Neal, Maury Wills, Jim Gilliam, Willie Davis, Tommy Davis. By the 1970s, the Dodgers became basically um, a, a white team. You have Steve Garvey, Bill Russell, Ron Say, Steve Yeager, Don Sutton. You do have Dusty Baker and Reggie Smith out there. And so what, what happens is that it basically starts to lose their own fan base in the, in the black community. There was definitely diversity missing, you know, in the Dodger fan base, but nobody paid any attention to that. There wasn't, wasn't anything people thought about or talked about. You know, baseball in general, you know, had a, probably had a, uh, a pretty white fan base. The cultural divide sometimes felt enormous, but Dodger Spanish language broadcaster Jaime Harin was, and continues to be, the bridge. The first thing that Mr. Walter Molly uh, did when he arrived in Los Angeles we, to go into a helicopter, take a flight, and see the demographics of Southern California. So he found that uh, it was so many Latinos in Southern California, especially Mexican-Americans and Mexicans. He decided to, to cover the games in both languages, English and Spanish. Jaime Harin was a, a, uh, a reporter. And so he did a lot of community reporting. Um, political events, political elections. On the Chicano Moratorium, he was actually there, and then that evening he came and broadcast a, a, a Dodger game, but he was there when Ruben Salazar was, was killed. The tens of thousands of Chicanos that are marching on Whittier Boulevard because of the Vietnam War, the social injustice, systemic racism, and then the buses of LA County Sheriff that arrive, buses that arrive to quell, control, arrest. He's there to cover the bar, cover the, the story of Ruben Salazar, and returns in the evening to call the night game. That's guts. I wasn't inside of the bar where he was killed. I was across the street because the police didn't, uh, didn't allow us to be inside of the bar. But we knew that something was going on there. Leaving the parade, I somebody shot at me because uh, I had the, the, the proof in my car. They missed my head by this much. Instead, Latinos gravitated towards sports where they found heroes that looked like them. At venues like the Olympic Auditorium. I loved wrestling. I loved a roller derby. I loved all of that because it was really about an event. When you're a kid, none of that wrestling looks fake. It looks, you know, it's like your superhero, right? Who's like standing up for your values, that sort of thing. Wednesday night was wrestling. Thursday night was boxing. And Friday night, I think, was roller derby. And so, uh, particularly during the boxing matches, when a lot of Mexicans would go and Mexican-Americans would go to the fights, I would sell the newspaper there, and uh, it was a big deal uh, back then. Boxing was number one, because we had, like, the Mexican fighters coming, and so everybody was at the Olympic. The Olympic Auditorium was a, a great gathering place. You'd have the gamblers there, you'd have the mobsters there, you had the Mexican-Americans there, you'd have the Mexicans there, you'd have the... the the celebrities, Richard Pryor, Ryan O'Neill, Burt Reynolds. Boxing was the place where you saw a great deal of uh, Latino fighters. We weren't really in baseball uh, in big numbers. We weren't in football. Uh, we weren't really in many sports. And so Fernando kind of sucked the 
oxygen out of the attention in some of those other sports. When Fernando came in, he was just, you know, there was our good Lord, and then there was Fernando. Yeah, I mean, that's just that. It was just that way. <laughs> L.A. was the place in 1981. The city commemorated its bicentennial with birthday celebrations throughout the year. Tom Bradley was elected to his third term as mayor, soundly defeating his old foe, former mayor Sam Yorty. A young musical provocateur named Prince was booed off the stage while opening for the Rolling Stones at the Coliseum. And for pro sports in L.A., it was a golden age. The Rams appeared in the Super Bowl in 1980. The Dodgers were always competitive, and the Lakers were attempting to defend the NBA title they'd won the year before with a dazzling rookie named Magic Johnson. The story has always been the Lakers, what they did, what they didn't do, how they failed, or if they were big. Every night there was a huge story of some sort. I arrived in a city where there is always a superstar. In fact, there were probably 20 of them. Vin Scully was, he wasn't even an athlete. Chick Hearn, there was always something going on here. That was the atmosphere, the Dodgers were beloved, the Lakers were beloved. The poor Clippers were kind of laughed at. UCLA basketball still had the remnants of John Wooden. This is heaven for a sports writer and a sports editor. The 1980s, uh, you know, was the, the era of uh, disco music and for me, uh, a bit of nightclubbing and dancing. Dodger and Laker teams were, you know, at the top of their game, if not winning championships uh, per se, but uh, at the end of the day, I think the world was focused on Fernando in 1981. Fernando was, was different, and nobody had a Fernando, and nobody had ever seen a Fernando before. 20-year-old Fernando Valenzuela remade the image of baseball in Los Angeles. Valenzuela had tossed 17 and two-thirds scoreless innings in relief when he made his debut the previous September. But when the Dodgers broke camp in 1981, he was slotted in as a team's number three starter. When Fernando came up in 1980, uh, nobody knew that it was going to be what, what was going to happen. He didn't even know he was around in 1980, uh, mainly because there were no expectations. Even in 1981, when camp broke and we went back to California for the freeway series, no one really thought that much about Fernando until that fateful day. As I recall, Jerry Royce was to be the opening day pitcher, and he couldn't do it. He had a physical problem. The day before opening day, I was in the outfield doing some running, and I felt my calf muscle pull. Now, I've had pulled calf muscles before, but I knew that this one was a little, a little worse than the other ones previously. So I walked into the trainer's room, showed him what had happened, and he contacted Lasorda, and we, it was determined that I wouldn't be the opening day starter. For some reason, they couldn't use Bert Hooten, who was, who was basically their number two pitcher. And Tommy had great confidence in Fernando, as he did in many young players. And he decided, along with the pitching coach, I think it was Ron Paranowski, give the ball to Fernando. I threw a bullpen day before the opening day, and um, because I was, um, I think was um, going to pitch the third game of the season. So Tommy asked me if I can, if I can pitch. And I was, first I thought that was, because Tommy loved to make jokes, you know, and I say, uh, no, it's, a, it's not a joke, it's serious. So that's, that's when I, I said, yeah, why not? No, he wasn't scared. He was happy that he going to start the game, start the game, the opening day. He wasn't scared, he never showed. It's, it's something that I, I like on him. He don't show, he wasn't able to the people. Just like another regular day, I'm going, just prepare myself and, that's it. It was amazing, and for myself and many others who were there, being Mexican, clearly this was something we were very proud of. I mean, I could still remember at the, at the game that uh, Fernando went to the second inning, the third inning, the fourth inning, and he kept on striking out. We were all very excited about it. I mean, obviously, and it was a, a, one of our uh, countrymen. He shut out the Astros, and I think he allowed only five hits, something like that. But then it's when really people realized that he was for, for sure, uh, a great pitcher. And Fernando uh, conducted himself like he was a, a pitcher with 10 years of experience. People didn't believe that it was his first game as a starter in the major leagues. The fans, they play a big role in that game, backing up Fernando, giving Fernando a great deal of support, 
And the way they received Fernando, when the Fernando came out to pitch, that was most, I say, the most impressive moment for Fernando in that day. I was back in the Dominican, and um, because we went all through high school in the Dominican. So this is April, right? But my dad says, hey, um, that kid Fernando is going to pitch. I'm like, next thing you know, we're watching highlights. There's Fernando on the, just mowing them down. Despite his opening day heroics, Valenzuela still enjoyed a degree of anonymity out of uniform, at least until he made his second start. When the game ended, we were waiting for him at the gates, and there's hundreds of fans cheering on. They're waiting for Garvey, Say, and the other Dodgers. Here comes Fernando, no one even, who's that? So he comes through, opened the gate, we got in the car and we left. Then he started the second game. So by now they knew it was a guy that won the last game. And there's a little more talk about him and he wins. Now we're waiting for him at the, uh, at the gate. The following time he, was, he started a game with the Dodgers and now people are saying, that's Fernando. They gave the ball to Fernando and nobody looked back because it was shut out, shut out, shut out, an extraordinary beginning to the 81 season. And I've often said that um, Fernando mania beginning on opening day right through the World Series was the most exciting time on my watch. It was like electrified the Mexican-American community. And all of a sudden, uh, just after the first game, is that newspapers and everybody began to say, who is this young man? He was obviously a star. He was somebody that was gonna rock the world for a while, and he did for quite a while. Dodgers owner Walter O'Malley had a keen understanding of demographics. In Brooklyn, his teams were filled with players who looked like guys from the neighborhood. When he moved the Dodgers to Los Angeles in 1958, he knew that fielding stars that mirrored the city would be good for the community and for business. It was always an idea to uh have the team reflect the community. It didn't start here. Probably had special nights, probably pre-game entertainment, probably printed a lot of things bilingual. He knew that, and that's what he wanted to have, really, really good players from Mexico. It took 23 years, but the Dodgers finally had their Mexican star. On opening day in 1981, 20-year-old Fernando Valenzuela, the pride of Echoaquila, Mexico, threw a five-hit shutout over the Houston Astros. But that was just the beginning. During his next three starts, all on the road, he allowed just one run over 27 innings, tossing three complete games and two shutouts. By the time Valenzuela returned to the Dodger Stadium mound on April 27, LA fans had become captivated by the rookie left-hander. He does a tremendous job and they by just, wow, you know, that, that's really amazing. And it was pretty much after that, you, you, know, you, you, you were thinking, you know, this guy can't top that. Next time out, he tops that. Next time out, he keeps on topping, and everybody says, well, what's going on? At that point, everybody started thinking, who is this guy? What is this guy? My gosh, you know, he was, he was only 20 years old. You know, just had incredible command. You didn't see this in great pitchers, not, you know, not to mention, you know, you know, young guys like him. For anybody, for any player, any athlete, I think when, when you have that people supporting you, you know, you, you can feel more comfortable, more, uh, more like, uh, yeah, I can do it. You know, I can do it for, for those people. They believe in me. When I go to the mound, I like to do him 100%. Like it was my, my last game, you know, I go all the way. He shut out the Astros. Then four days later, he came again. The way people reacted to, to that was, was unbelievable. Our audience increased so, so much. It was unbelievable, unbelievable. That's why I think that Fernando is a player that created more new, new baseball fans and Dodger fans than any other pitcher. He was 8-0 with five shutouts and a 0 0.50 earned run average. But I mean, it was those, those, those first eight games, they were just unbelievable, just, you know, just knock your eyes out. By the end of April, the frenzy surrounding the pitcher even had its own name, Fernando Mania. I can tell you that I really became a Dodger fan when we saw, uh, you know, Fernando. Certainly drove a lot of Latinos uh, to the Dodgers. There was this pride in knowing that there was somebody uh, who was born and raised in Mexico, by the way. He wasn't Mexican-American and just was the sensation that he was. 
Until Fernando, it was pretty much a white fan base. The fan base for Fernando was there because Fernando was a great player. But the fan base for the Dodgers remained well after Fernando and to this day. This is sport, but it's entertainment for the fans, you know. And we, uh, and myself, I try to do my my best so they can they can have a good good game and good entertainment they, to to have a nice day in the park. Latinos started coming to the stadium in droves to watch Valenzuela pitch many rooting for the Dodgers for the first time. I think people needed a reason to forgive the Dodgers for what they did in Chavez Ravine. And I think they found an excuse and a reason. So, okay, you know what, let's, let's go back. Because after that, people started going to uh, Dodger Stadium, started supporting the Dodgers. People that for years and years had refused to do it until they figured, okay, they've given this Chicano, Latino, Mexican a chance. Fernando was really key in bringing the hearts and minds of, of La Raza back, back to the stadium or to the stadium really for the first time. When Fernando came in, he was, there was no doubt he was Mexican. I mean, he would even look up at God before he, before he threw a ball. It became, you had to go to the game. And, and, and literally, when the police would stop you, if Fernando was playing, they wouldn't say, what are you doing? They go, why aren't you at the park? You know, because <laughs> you were doing something wrong if you weren't at the baseball park. The first sort of like sports superhero comes to town and he looks like somebody from your, the place back home. It's not just you as a kid sort of having something to identify to, an image, right? But it's my dad owning it. It's my, my neighborhood owning it. He also does not look like the traditional hero. Yeah, he looked more like a wrestler, <laughs> honestly. You know, and he, like the average guy. And, and people would laugh, my father laughed. My father said he looks just like a typical, you know, Mexicano. You know, the average Mexican-American that comes and fix your plumbing or, you know, puts a roof on your house. He was pudgy, he was small. He was what they call gordito, you know, he was kind of fat. He was a gordito just, just like everybody else in, in East LA. He was somebody that everybody in East LA could relate to. There is this sense that he is someone you really want to support and stand behind because in many ways, he looks like he can't win. He's going to flip the whole script on what you've known or what you believe this sport to be. We can't all be Nolan Ryan, but your kid can be Fernando Valenzuela. On the nights Valenzuela pitched in 1981, Dodger Stadium just felt different, overtaken by a festive energy. It was electric. There, there had never really been anything like that. Obviously, LA fans had seen, in an earlier days, had seen Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale. Uh, but th but this, was, this was different. This was just kind of so wild and out of nowhere. He was very popular, let's put it this way, all over the world, people were coming. We had friends who figured out in advance, unless there was a rain delay or a canceled game because of rain, when he would pitch 30 days out. Hey, Peter, do you have room or can you get me two tickets for a game 30 days out? That was unusual. We had never had those requests before. It was like watching the Pope, you know, it's like, I mean, like, like being in Venezuela when the Pope shows up. If they could have fit a million people into that stadium, there'd have been a million people there. And it was full whenever he was on the mound. Whenever the inning was over and the Dodgers came to hit, it seems if they had to go on a beer run or use the, the restroom, they did it while the Dodgers were hitting because they didn't want to miss a thing regarding Fernando. It was like an East LA backyard party. When Fernando was pitching, was a sellout, no question about the Dodger Stadium. Then at home, I know that ladies, especially, especially mothers and, and, and grandmothers, start, start, start praying and, and praying the rosary because Fernando was, was preaching that day. So uh, he became God, really, in Southern California. It was unbelievable. He felt like a, he was like a family member that you would go visit every four days at Dodger Stadium. I remember my, my aunt, my tia Felipa, who loved the Dodgers and loved baseball, and she would always tune in to the Spanish language radio and then watch it on TV. She was so excited about Fernando. Uh, and, and I think that that's the same kind of sense and feeling that everyone had in the community. And they were proud that he was there. I mean, she was from Mexico. She had immigrated here, had all the, you know, the language issues initially. So she was very proud to see him there. One thing about the, the Mexican people, when they, they have a hero, 
they will never give up on that hero. Even, even the good times and the bad times, they will always support him. And as Walter O'Malley predicted, having a star Mexican player did wonders for the team's bottom line. I remember when I started doing the games at the Coliseum, the Latinos coming to the, to the Coliseum was probably 8%, 10%. But later on, the number of uh, Mexicans and Latinos coming to Rajo Stadium went up, up, up. People were out there selling Fernando t-shirts before and after the game. I think they were drawing about an extra 8,000 people a game with Fernando. They started to hire Spanish-speaking ushers. They started bringing in Mexican-American food. So there was clearly a cultural shift that year. And the passion for Valenzuela extended far beyond Chavez Ravine. There's Mexicans everywhere in the United States began to come to the games to see Fernando. Ball clubs were talking about five to 10,000 extra walk-ups to whenever Fernando pitched. Uh, and, and people noticed that many of the people that were in line getting extra tickets were brown. I noticed uh, our ratings went from uh, 0.3 to 7.8. It was unheard of that. And, uh, and then it started, you know, people calling from Mexico, we have to create a, a new network. We had 65 radio stations in Mexico alone, carrying the games to every corner of Mexico. Baseball became the number one sport right away to many people. People from Mexico, from Central America, from South America, didn't care about baseball. But because of Fernando, they started learning uh, the game. Mr. O'Malley would have enjoyed so much uh, fi finally watching a Sandy, Mexican Sandy Koufax playing for the Dodgers. There were many reasons Dodger fans fell in love with Fernando Valenzuela in 1981. Obviously, the numbers were great. Valenzuela's midseason 9-4 record earned him the starting assignment at the 1981 All-Star Game. He was just the second rookie pitcher to ever earn the starting nod. But there was something deeper, almost magical, about watching the 20-year-old pitch. Cosmic, man. Cosmic. Just his concentration, his discipline, and then that look up just before delivery. I thought the guy was dying. His eyes rolled back in his head. I said, what the heck is that? He's not even looking where the ball's going to be going. I always thought he was, when he was looking at the sky, he was looking at the heavens, at God for inspiration for that little bit extra kick. His wind-up alone on the pitcher's mound is ritualistic. It's ceremonial. It's Mexican. Que loco, you know, it, it's, it's that, that his craziness is part of the cure. La locura cura. I mean, this, this guy is like, he goes for broke on every pitch. His, his eyes are in the back of his head. It, he has some sort of otherworldly supernatural powers. People said, ask him why. Uh, I, I, I think that I look up and when, as I'm coming down, it makes me look for the target and that distracts me from doing other things wrong. And in pitching, that makes a lot of sense. Valenzuela's windup may have wild fans and distracted batters, but it was his mastery of the screwball that kept him off balance. Few in big league history successfully threw the pitch. Before Valenzuela, the best known screwball pitcher was the New York Giants' Carl Hubble. King Carl's best years were in the 1930s. What I remember about Fernando was the, the screwball. Uh, it was uh, untouchable, right? It confounded batters and uh, in many ways was like a disruptor. So he had this, this freak pitch. I don't remember anybody else at the time that threw, I'm sure there are other guys throwing screwballs, not a lot of them, not as many as Fernando would throw and not with the consistency and not with the effectiveness. Even now, there's not a lot of screwball pitchers. It's just a, a weird pitch. Valenzuela was taught to screwball by fellow Dodger Bobby Castillo in the winter of 1979. Castillo himself learned it from Ray Lara, who pitched at Lincoln High School in the 1960s. I threw the screwball. I went in, I worked with uh, Bobby Castillo. They were looking at Fernando real close. They said he may need a, a third pitch or another pitch. He already threw the screwball. They sent Bobo to San Antonio so that he could refine it. Amazingly enough, he never hurt his shoulder or, or, or elbow because of the screwball. And then uh, they sent me to um, to Double A with San Antonio, Texas League, and uh, that's when um, I keep drawing. And then finally I say, I'm not going to use anymore because my record was so bad. I was under 500 winning and losing. So. They tell me, um, we don't looking for your numbers. We're looking to, to learn that page. Soon I find the release point and uh, to throw on that page. 
the ball started moving uh, over the plate more and, um, and uh, started working. Sherman Oaks Notre Dame High School baseball coach Tom Dill explains the nuances of the screwball with assistance from former minor league pitcher Josh Goosen Brown. Basically, it's going to be a pitch that the pitcher is going to pronate his hand this way. Um, and it's going to put like a reverse slider spin on a pitch, which, which then will make the ball break the other direction. So let's say you're throwing a, a slider might be here where you're going to get a spiral and the ball is going to break this way for a right hander. Then a screw ball, if you're coming here, it's going to break the other direction. A guy like Fernando, his was very unique and very different. I used to study it all the time because it was the pitch. He held his like this. The way he threw it was two fingers. And he threw it with two, and you can see I've got my thumb here and my middle finger here. He threw it like this and came down this way. And the reason Fernando's was even different is this would have been the accepted way to throw a screwball. But he literally would get his fingers on top of the ball, sometimes this way, like a backwards curveball. So he would literally come on this side of the ball with his fingers curved here, where it would literally be like a curveball spinning out this way, which to me is unheard of. That's one of the things on changeups, you can, hitters can see a lot more of your hand, where on his, he throws with two fingers, like a two seam fast one, and then he would get that extra movement on it by just really over pronating it and, uh, getting that thing to just run really inside on hitters. And I think that's what made it such a, such a good pitch for him. And that's why he was one of the best to ever do it. He had this confidence, you know, like, like, hey, I own this place. Tonight, the stadium is mine. He would walk out there, there with his long hair. He'd wind up and he would look up to the heavens. And, and that, that, that was something that I'll always never forget. And then throw a screwball that would just break as hard as anybody could throw it. He had everything going. He had, he had uh, the cultural issue. He had the greatest screwball in the world. And then he had this image that they had nine, 950,000 pictures were taken of Fernando at this point or looking up in the sky. And he was everything. When Fernando Valenzuela began his incredible run with the Dodgers in 1981, he was a virtual mystery to the press and most fans. We knew he was a kid from Mexico who had arrived to Los Angeles with a wicked screwball that flummoxed batters, but his bio was a blank slate. Here's this young man from Echoaquia, small community in Mexico. Speaks very little English, looks up to the top of his cap or to heaven as he delivers the ball. It was a great mystique about him. Right from the start, uh, it was a big deal. <laughs> you had to pay attention because number one, you had the backstory of Fernando, how he came out of nowhere. And then you had the fact that he was a, a, a Mexican kid, a kid from Mexico, which was rare and kind of exotic at the time in the major leagues. And you had the fact that he had burst onto the scene so quickly. Won a couple of games his rookie year, had an unusual style and all that stuff and had brought the big following out of the Latino and Mexican fans. It was clear that this was a sensation that might last a week or two weeks or something like that, but while it was going, it was a big deal. The best part about it was just being there. To have it be my, my beat and my story and have it be as special as it was, I mean, you know, you don't get them like that. We'd have four or five, six people out there on some nights in a big game, uh, you know, doing everything from fans in the stands to uh, Fernando's style that night to what he did before the game. It was, this is Los Angeles. That was the same with Shaq. That was the same with Kobe. This is Hollywood, and when there is a taste of a star, we go at it. And, and in those days, the you know, Los Angeles Times had the resources to go at it like no other paper. The local media was hungry to uncover the details, but access to Valenzuela was mostly limited to press conferences arranged by the team. He would do the press conferences after games when he pitched, and it was always kind of fairly brief and with a translator and uh, very little substance there. He'd always start every, every statement with bueno. It's, you'd ask him a question and he'd say, bueno, uh, I, I pitched pretty good tonight. I had my screwball working. and. Very basic stuff. He just didn't give you give you much color. He didn't speak the language at all. Uh, 
I don't know if he understood some, I don't think so. So in 1981, I started uh, being with Fernando. I was uh, really surprised to see the way he conducted himself. Many people thought that probably he didn't realize how big he was and everything around him. He knew exactly what was going on all the time. I think he knew what was happening. It was just a matter of saying, you know what? I'm gonna lay back, stay on the side. It was this way, there was no problem, anything that happened or anything that, you know, if I, he didn't have to then uh, explain himself if anything went wrong. The only thing I know is uh, what's, what's going on on the field, you know, and, and really that's not surprised me, all the people or all the, all the media wanna, wanna talk. One thing about Fernando is he never seemed to say the wrong things. Uh, he said, I'd rather stay quiet if I don't know how to answer the question. And I said, good. And I remember, for instance, in New York, it was a madhouse at Shea Stadium was about at least 100 reporters. The strike was coming on soon, and they start asking very difficult questions about the strike. And he only said, look, I am here to pitch. I don't know much about, about contracts and, and, and things like that. So next question, please. He was good with the press because he didn't have, he couldn't talk to him. <laughs> I mean, that was good too. He, could, he couldn't say stupid things because he couldn't understand the language. But it didn't stop local media outlets like the LA Times and La Opinion from trying to learn more about the pitcher. He wasn't comfortable, was not comfortable doing uh, interviews. I understand that it was, it was hard for him. It was not his nature. He was outgoing around his teammates. He was very playful and, and they loved him and he got along great and... Fernando gave our photographer more access. What uh, Fernando, what happened was this. He was not a well-educated guy as far as uh, uh, academically. So he, he used to hang around with people that were also not very highly academically uh, involved. So our photographer was also like a street guy out of Chihuahua, out of uh, Ciudad Juarez. So he, he, they spoke the language. They say, hey, you know, how's and body and so on. And they, 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 he became uh, very trustworthy for him. And they became very buddy-buddy. So he, this guy used to take a box of balls and had a sign. And the guy said, he got, we would laugh. He said, you know what, I, I, I paid my house with, with authorized, uh, or I mean, uh, sign, sign uh, memorabilia. So that's how well they got along at that point. The local papers may have been left trying to get Fernando Valenzuela's story, but Fernando Mania nevertheless had an enormous impact on them. I have no doubt that Fernando's success and, and the sensation he created and the energy he brought just created, I, I'm sure, more of an awareness of the Latino community in, in Los Angeles. And I have no doubt that that caused the Los Angeles Times and other papers to pay more attention to these people. Fernando pretty much, I would say, sold 60% over what, what was being sold before. I think Fernando did have an impact on our editorial judgment. It opened up some eyes. Uh, we, I know we gave more freedom and license to a guy like Frank Delamo, who wrote a lot about him, followed him closely, and, and I think Frank led the, the push for Pulitzer Prize that, that we won. When you see your base of, of readership reacting the way they did to Fernando, you do not stop and say, well, we don't have to do these kind of stories because those people only read La Opinion. Those people are our people and those people are readers. And so, yeah, let's take a look at a deeper thing, not based on baseball. And that's why and how we won a Pulitzer Prize. I think that is all connected. In 1981, as it still is today, immigration from Mexico into the United States was a hot button political issue. When Ronald Reagan was inaugurated as president, no meaningful new immigration laws had passed since 1965, and tensions between the countries was high. In June of 81, President Reagan invited Mexico President José López Portillo to the White House for a state lunch. And he also requested the presence of a certain 20-year-old pitcher from the Los Angeles Dodgers. Right in the middle of the baseball season, Ronald Reagan invites Fernando Valenzuela into the White House and then invites the president of Mexico for lunch. The president of Mexico was, and the people of Mexico were not very happy with American politics in which they were treating Mexican workers that were coming here and doing all the work, and, and yet they were being demonized, and they were talking about building a seven-foot wall. It was called then the tortilla wall, that uh, with Fernando there, I think it, it really lowered the, the political temperature at the time. Dodger Spanish language broadcaster Jaime Jarin joined Valenzuela on the trip. I will say 150, 200 people there. Being inside the White House, that's very unique, very special. The Marine Corps band was, was playing beautiful, beautiful arrangements of very well-known Mexican songs. And Fernando was delighted. 
they were for the first time that I saw, probably the only time that I saw Fernando excited was when we were going from the airport to the hotel, to the Hyatt Hotel in, in, in Washington, when he saw the, the monuments, uh, the Lincoln Monument, the Jefferson Monument. He was really excited. He couldn't believe it. You only watch it on, uh, on TV, you know, and, um, and be part of the two persons and be in the same room. As, it's a dream, you know, what, what one more I, I can ask. He was trying to explain to me the feeling when he was at the White House um, and sitting there between the two presidents and he said, you know, it's, uh, my dream was to play Major League Baseball. I never thought I would get to play for the Dodgers. And he says, now here I am with my president and the president of the United States sitting here having dinner in the White House. He goes, I know I'm, I know I'm young, but I thought my dream was, I'd reached my dream and, and look where I'm at now. You see this kid, long hair, a little bit chubby, you know, and uh, no, no English to be there, the center of the attention, and to see a line by the Vice President George Bush, the Secretary of State Alexander Haig, the Secretary of the Defense Weinberger, the most powerful people in government, in, in line waiting for this kid from Mexico to sign them an, 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 an autograph, a baseball. That was really very unique, very special. That I keep that picture in my mind, you know, every day, because this shows me what this country is. And so both Republicans and Democrats wanted to be seen with Fernando. He was political dynamite to, to have a picture with them. So when you went back to your constituencies, especially your, your Spanish speaking constituents in Detroit or Chicago, is that you could say you took a picture with Fernando. I mean, he was, he was something you wanted to have a picture with. Made everybody proud because it, it seemed like it was, it was somebody that had met, did something that wasn't, so, wasn't uh, you know, that, that he was brought in because of his accomplishments. And it was not a political move. It just felt like this guy was brought over because he was, in fact, what he was doing, what it, said, what it meant to people. It just became something of a, of a matter of fact of somebody that is doing good in the, in the, in the sport, that he's getting the recognition by the presidents. So he, 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 it was meaning, meaningful then to people. We're proud of the fact that he was at the White House. And of course, Ronald Reagan was our governor and a movie star. And from California, there was a lot of, even though many of us are the opposite party, but they tell us, and we read about the fact that we don't know for exactly that more of the, that most of the dialogue that evening was about immigration. And so I don't know if that made the president at that time more sympathetic to those kinds of issues, but he was from California, so he understood the, the impact and, and the kind of positive contribution that Mexicanos were making here in California and the economy. And certainly Fernando knew those issues and understood them well. I think he appreciated that he was able to immigrate as easily as he did when he knew full well that you know, many of his own family, his, his own people were having trouble and the kind of illegal situation that was creating for many of the people who were living in the shadows at that time. It didn't happen overnight, but in 1986, President Reagan signed the Immigration Control Act, AKA the Amnesty, into law. Uh, President Reagan signed the first comprehensive immigration bill since 1965 that established three million undocumented persons who became US citizens uh, from a Republican president. This was amazing. It was welcomed when we when we got the president to to pass immigration reform and to have amnesty at that time. It was welcomed, and I think not a lot of people tie it directly to Fernando and and that particular White House meeting. But I think there's a line that could be drawn, and I don't see why not. Fernando understood those issues very well and could speak very plainly and clearly about it. Commentators at the time, and there are even Chicano historians today that call it the Fernando factor. I mean, not the, it wasn't the entire factor, but clearly Fernando played a major part in, in shifting the policy, shifting the tone from punitive to in, in, in terms of um, creating three million uh, new citizens out of undocumented. He played a role very well, role that he, I think he, he became the best ambassador that Mexico have ever had, you know, because of the people that reacted to him. He didn't want to get involved in politics. It was a very touching situation with him. He is a very private person. I admire him for that. And, uh, but he conducted himself beautifully, beautifully. Reagan 
knew that many of these undocumented persons would probably vote Democrat, but he knew that, that Fernando had given both governments of Mexico an opening that they could go ahead and, and for, for a little bit, set aside partisan politics on the issue of immigration and sign a comprehensive immigration bill. We are, you know, immigrants, and they have received us with open arms, Fernando and myself, and they have, uh, they have given us the opportunities to, to reach another uh, places, to, to be able to, to achieve what we wanted to achieve. Fernando Valenzuela's artistry on the mound left a lasting impression on LA's Latino community and fans of Major League Baseball. But the picture has also been amused to musicians, artists, and writers who have featured Valenzuela in song, on stage, and in paintings. During Valenzuela's 1981 rookie season, Barbara Carrasco was commissioned by the LA Community Redevelopment Agency in conjunction with the city's Bicentennial Committee to create a mural for LA's 200th birthday. I was only 26 years old at the time. I was an employee of the CRA. I was doing uh, topographical maps. And then one of the architects approached me and asked me if I would like to do a mural about anything to do with LA. And for some reason, I thought the history would be a really good thing to focus in on because I, I hadn't seen a history of Los Angeles mural. So that's how it started. The size of the mural is 16 feet high by 80 feet long. So it's a history, chronological history of Los Angeles in a woman's hair. The woman is sort of the mythical queen of Los Angeles. She has a braid on her head instead of a crown. A lot of the people that are in the mural, there's a lot of different individuals that are, some are famous, some are not famous, but some have played a role in the Los Angeles community. I was sort of honoring them by doing their portrait, actually capturing a little bit of their contributions to the city's history. As Carrasco created her mural, Valenzuela was just starting to leave his own mark on Los Angeles. In the course of writing this, um, doing the history of the mural, um, my mother and I met Fernando Valenzuela at a fundraiser, and my mother approached him and told him, my daughter did a mural, she would like to include you, it is part of the history of Los Angeles. And he, he was like such a nice guy, real humble guy. I was real happy that he said yes. I really felt like he was someone to really pay homage to, you know, and acknowledge his role in L.A. history. The 80-foot mural, L.A. History, A Mexican Perspective, is in the permanent collection at the L.A. Museum of Natural History. While Carrasco wasn't too much of a baseball fan growing up, musician Steve Wynn was obsessed with the game as a kid in West L.A., but he hated the Dodgers. But the Reds also were just flat out exciting. You know, before Pete Rose was tarnished by everything that happened afterwards, he was an exciting player, and Joe Morgan, the whole team was, it was exciting. And the Dodgers were just, to me, not an exciting team. Steve Garvey was as far away from rock and roll as you could possibly get. Steve Garvey and Bill Russell was like so, you know, staid, white bread, kind of boring, factory tested <laughs> kind of ball players. It wasn't my thing. It didn't, didn't fit into what I was into. That all changed in 1981 when Wynn got swept up in Fernando Mania. Like most people from LA, I grew up to the sound of Vince Scully. That was like the greatest sound in the world to me. So I listened to games all the time. And I remember driving around in the spring of 81, hearing him call those games. And I think appreciating LA now as an adult, you know, suddenly being able to drive around and know the city better and know the landscape of the city and the character of the city and all the diversity of the city with the story of what was happening with Fernando and seeing the way that he was embraced by so many people, different backgrounds, different nationalities, different interests, different histories, everything, to see that happening was exciting. It was intoxicating and I really, I'm sure for a lot of people now, and I, I would say those first two or three months of the 81 season made me fall back in love with Los Angeles, become a Dodger fan, and become obsessed with Fernando. It was, it was really had a huge impact on me. Over his career, Wynn has covered lots of musical terrain in bands like the Dream Syndicate and Gutterball. And in 2007, he co-founded the Baseball Project in which his day job mashes up with his love for the national pastime. The band has released three albums of baseball-oriented rock. Wynn also wrote Fernando, which serves as a theme song for this series. Fernando, that was like one of the things I said, well, if I ever do this thing, which I really want to do, if I ever find this way to kind of write a rock album of ball players, if nothing else, because he meant so much to me at that one moment. He's so defined an excitement that I felt that other people felt. <laughs> Over the course of my time in LA and ever since, and of course, even in recent times, seeing, you know, the, um, 
anti-immigration legislation trying to be, a, be passed, it made me think about this timeline from the, the from 1960 when when families' homes were raised to build Dodge Stadium, when Mexican families' entire community was was wiped out, to 20 years later, Fernando being beloved by an entire city, to where we were in years before, since, and when I wrote the song, to see a typical thing where people have no problem with 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 people of color or people of certain nationalities if they're in show business or in sports, but the second it turns to day-to-day -day life or politics suddenly have a whole different story. So this it's, it was a lot to cover in a three minute song, but I wanted to do that. I speak Spanish and I learned at a young age, so um, if not fluent, pretty close. And so I had the idea, I'd really like to write the song in Spanish. I'm proud of the song. I think I kind of managed to nail that whole timeline in, a, in three verses pretty decently. Valenzuela appears as an apparition in playwright Judy Sue Hu's digital production, Sandy Coto of the San Gabriel Valley, about a teenage pitcher who wants to learn to throw the screwball. She comes from a long baseball family who is steeped in the Japanese American Baseball Leagues, and Sandy wants to learn the screwball because her dad threw it, her great-granddad do it, and, um, and she wants to learn from one of the best, which is Fernando. That's his signature pitch. Su Hu remembers watching Valenzuela pitch on TV as a kid in New Mexico. We would sort of cheer his windup because it was sort of this crazy, chaotic, look up at the sky, go for broke windup. I always thought he was, when he was looking at the sky, he was looking at the heavens, at God for inspiration for that little bit extra kick. Valenzuela was never far from Suhu's mind when writing Sandy Cotto. I think Sandy find a kindred spirit in Fernando that they're both outsiders. She was playing a game as a girl and a game that does not allow girl pitchers so much. He was such an outsider that he made baseball interesting. I guess he's a special, unique individual. He's one of the pitchers of that era who was a standout and it was one of the greats and I think she wanted to, to touch that sort of greatness. Richard Montoya grew up in Northern California rooting for the Giants, but Valenzuela's starts became must-watch events in his home. The nation was mesmerized and my father, uh, a good enough baseball man and a poet and an activist and a Chicano artist was well aware something was happening and that we needed to be watching it. It was like uh, watching Midnight Mass on Christmas Eve or, you know, it's hushed, sit, nobody talk, nobody move. Today we're pulling for the Mexican with Dodger Blue on. But Dad, we have our Giants hats on. Shut up, put those away! When Montoya relocated to L.A. with the performance troupe Culture Clash, he began researching the story of the residents in Bishop, La Loma, and Palo Verde. The end result was the 2003 play Chavez Ravine. Chavez Ravine is one of our landmark pieces that looks at the complications of a growing, hungry city and a city that wanted and needed baseball and, and the neighborhood that the stadium sits in. It was idyllic, beautiful homes for hundreds of children, hundreds of families, servicemen, servicewomen, ball players. We met people that told us, you know, I was born behind second base. When my brother was born, the sobadora, the, the midwife lady, placed our umbilical cords under third base. And we always imagined that those spirits and those people that lost homes and lived there whose umbilical cords were buried deep in the infield were either communicating, helping, or cursing uh, the Dodgers since the time of Fernando, but we'd always imagined that Fernando could be in communication with, with that sort of Mexican heart that beats at, at mid-infield. It's about church, it's about people. It's about Fernando Valenzuela. It's about comedy. It's about and, Walter O'Malley. And poetry. The barrios, the homes, the people mm. scattered into dark oblivion. Mm. The city pushing down on the heart of memory. In Chavez Ravine, Valenzuela serves as a flashpoint, a symbol of both the past and the future. At the beginning of the play Chavez Ravine, we find Fernando is on the mound. Vince Scully is noting that Fernando looks a little uh, shaky on his feet. He seems to be talking to nobody near the second base, and the nobody are spirits that are talking to him in mid-conversation with Fernando. And we follow Fernando in the play through the nine innings. We pick up 
you know, in the sixth, the mid seventh, the stretch, and and the final inning of the of the shutout, which we claim as a spiritual and ritualistic moment for Mexicans of this town, for the city of LA, for the Dodgers, and for Fernando. It's kind of a thank you to, to Fernando too. It's not a put down whatsoever. And really an embrace and, a, and, a, and an acknowledgement, a thank you for a practical, humble Mexican kid that comes to this town and turns it upside down. Their modes of expression may be different, but for each of these artists, Fernando Valenzuela has been a revelation. I mean, people were so proud of this guy without knowing him, without knowing him personally, of course. But I felt proud of him too, that he, this guy um, was, was being, um, you know, receiving all these accolades and praise for, for being a, a really great athlete. He wanted to share for the underdog. And he wasn't necessarily a, a bonus baby who was supposed to be great and had to live up to that. Kind of came out of nowhere. And I think it was people excited to see this impossible thing happening. This is really, unlikely stories. For something to come along like Fernando Valenzuela that really united a whole city, that made everybody across the city think about this one subject, this one guy, and just dumbfounded by where this came from and where it was going, was pretty exciting. The way he saw the game, the way he felt the game, really was special. And I think that's what we got intuitively. We got his passion, I think. That's what was really special. We got his passion. Fernando mania was a mania. We lost ourselves for a shining summer, for a fantastic moment. Mexicans are no longer in the background of LA. The east side is not just gazing at the west side. Mexicans are in the foreground. The focus is Fernando. Fernando mania was put on pause when major league players went on strike on June 12th, 1981. At the time, the Dodgers were leading the National League West. When play resumed nearly two months later, the Dodgers were declared the winners of the season's first half, which was a good thing because the team was sluggish the rest of the way, going just 27 and 26. The same can be said of Fernando Valenzuela's performance on the mound. After his magical 8-0 start, he finished the regular season 13 and seven with a 2.48 earned run average. The strike killed the momentum a lot. You know, he was, he was doing unbelievable. And then they shut down. We didn't play for 50 days. That's going to break the rhythm for anybody. So in, at least in that respect, all of us were in the same boat. And when they started playing again, he was, he was, he wasn't ordinary, but he was closer to ordinary than, than what he had been before. He, he didn't go back to that, that incredible level that he had before, but he was still really good. The Dodgers regained their mojo in time for the postseason, which due to the strike featured an extra round of playoffs. After eliminating the Astros in the first round, they played a thrilling five-game championship series against the Montreal Expos. Valenzuela got the win in the clincher, giving up just three hits and eight and two-thirds innings in a dramatic two-to-one victory. But the pitcher's performance was almost an afterthought. The Dodgers wound up playing in Montreal, and Rick Monday hit a home run to win the game and was became known as Dodger Blue Monday. And I remember, and Fernando pitched that game, and he pitched a real, pitched a real good game. Rick Monday was the story of that game, not Fernando. Fernando was um, was a story, there's no question about that. But winning the pennant, winning the playoffs, an extra set of playoffs, that was its own story within itself. It was unique in that there was never an extra layer of playoffs to get uh, to the league championship series and ultimately the World Series. The Dodgers were a veteran team in 1981. Many players had been on the losing end of three World Series in the 1970s. So there was a sense of urgency in the matchup against the Yankees, who defeated them in 1977 and 1978. There were guys who came up through the organization that were now uh, reaching 30, or they were already in their 30s, so they were on the backside of their careers. There were players who had come over previously in trades that played in the 77 and 78 World Series that had never won one. And then there was my group that had played in neither of those World Series, but had joined the ball club and were instrumental in the success of the team as it stood in the early 80s. And then the final group was the kids who were coming up through the organization and experiencing it for the first time. So it was a mix and match to put all of these players together, knowing that all of us were a year older and perhaps this would be the last chance for us to win as a group. 
After dropping the first two games in New York, the Dodgers were feeling an unpleasant sense of World Series deja vu. At the time, no baseball team had ever rebounded from a three games to none playoff deficit. Valenzuela was asked to stop the bleeding. He got the start in game three back in Los Angeles. They had already lost the first two games, so that was a key, key game. My turn was about the third game, so I say, well, that's, that's the time. That's the real, the real time, because we're serious. It's, it's a very important game for them. Not only for, for myself, for the team, but uh, for the city, for the fans. You know, the people talk about Fernando, how good he was, and he never led that to his set. He got a good control himself. He knew how big those games were. So he was prepared for the World Series. He pitched like every other game. He, was, he wasn't trying to do anything different. Throw a strike and try to get it out. But Valenzuela was shaky and wild, giving up four runs in the first three innings. The Yankees had him on the ropes early on, and manager Tommy Lasorda almost pulled the rookie when he got into a jam in the fourth inning. That's when we saw really, really how, how tough, how valiant Fernando was. Tried to think in what I can do it now so I can get out of this jam. I got a little problem with the control and all that. He didn't have his good stuff that day. The Yankees really treated him badly, but he kept pitching, he kept pitching. La Sorda came to the mound several times thinking of taking him out, but I don't know how Fernando was able to convince La Sorda to let him in. La Sorda went to talk to him and says, hey, listen, if, no, if these guys don't get on, we'll win this game in Spanish. And Fernando looked at him and goes, really? So, I mean, he was thinking of joking even in a moment like that. They're up by one run and the guy didn't, he didn't sweat it. He was like a fighter really going to go down to the canvas. And I don't know how he did. He kept up and he's still pitching and pitching and pitching. That was the toughest game I, I can remember any pitcher had, uh, especially on a World Series. But he was able to finish the game. Valenzuela gutted it out, throwing a complete game in the Dodgers' 5-4 victory. But he didn't win so much as survive. He threw 146 pitches, giving up nine hits and walking seven, two intentionally. But the momentum had shifted, and the Dodgers defeated the Yankees in six games, four to two. Oh, Fernando was not worried about pitch counts, innings pitch. He was worried about the next pitch, and he's so smart. He knew how to set up hitters, and for him, even the World Series was just another game which is why his career was so good, because he treated every moment and didn't make it as bigger than it was. To him, he was playing catch with a catcher. You know, 50,000 fans at Yankee Stadium, so what? 55,000 at Dodger Stadium, so what? He just kept battling. He was fortunate in that he had Mike Socia as a catcher. And Mike was smart enough to recognize that if one or two of his pitches weren't working, he could still get Fernando through the inning with whatever pitches he had left until those pitches came back. It was fun watching the two of them work together. It was a very special year, 1981. Very special. I honestly, I honestly think that we will never see another season like 1981. No way, no way. And because of Fernando Valenzuela. Fernando Valenzuela capped his remarkable 1981 season by winning both the Cy Young and Rookie of the Year awards. The only player in Major League history to earn both in the same year. He would continue to pitch for the Dodgers until 1990, winning 141 games along the way. But after a few so-so seasons, the Dodgers cut Valenzuela in the spring of 91. They got what they needed out of Fernando, and I think Fernando got enough of what he needed from the Dodgers. It was a give and take thing. Uh, uh, when he was with the Dodgers, they did plenty of things for Fernando. I think they, they overused him, but uh, he, he could have said no. He, he wasn't thinking of, of Money at all, he just loves the sport. He never ever talked about, oh, I wanna make this, I'm gonna make that. Just went out there and played baseball. When the Dodgers released Fernando Valenzuela, it was just like the dream had ended. When he was gone, it was a big void, you know, big void, uh, you know, to go see the Dodgers and being a fan. 
The Dodgers made their decision after showcasing the pitcher in a spring exhibition start in Monterrey, Mexico, against fellow countryman Teddy Higuera and the Milwaukee Brewers. Shortly after the game ended, they released Fernando. And he said, hey, why didn't you release me before this game against Teddy? Business. We were all heartbroken because we had, we had lived through all the good times with Fernando, you know, he had brought uh, honor. He had brought, you know, so much to, to the Mexican community. You know, he was a genuine hero. So when uh, he left, and it wasn't in the best terms. Remember, it was not in the best terms. He won't badmouth the Dodgers. No, 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 no. He, uh, he owes them a lot. You know, I think it's, they owe each other. It's a, it's a marriage. And uh, so he, um, us, on the other hand, we're, we're pretty upset. So, you know, we're saying, you know, why didn't they release you before? And hey, you know, that's, that's just the way it goes. And the Mexican American community took that personally. Um, again, they said, well, that's just like uh, what, you know, typically how they treat Mexicans. They'll use us and for our labor, but once we're not effective, they'll just throw us away. Kicked him to the curb, but he, you know, he, he bounced around other teams. It was, it was never the same, you know, it's never the same. Valenzuela continued to pitch in the big leagues until 1997 with the Angels, the Orioles, Phillies, Padres, and Cardinals. The Fernando mania energy kind of stuck around. Even when he kind of sunk into mediocrity, he never stopped being Fernando. He was always the guy with the, from the exotic, strange place with the weird pitch and the weird look, and he was always Fernando. Watching, I think, your heroes get old is always really, really hard. Watching them lose the thing that they're, they're, they're really extraordinary at, you, you have to transition. Transitions are a big part of, of our culture, right? So I think we get that. We get the, the, the notion that everything changes. You grieve the sense that people get older and they shift and change and their bodies change. It, it, it's a tragedy and it's also kind of like a beautiful reality of life. But as Mexicans, we are deeply connected to the notion of, of change because that's what our entire lives are built on, change and death, right? We commune with the dead. Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead. I mean, we have a, a, a never ending relationship with the notion that you change, you change, you change. After stints pitching in the Mexican Winter League, Valenzuela retired for good in 2006 at age 49. But he's never really left baseball. Fernando's been a member of the Dodger Spanish language broadcast team since 2003. And he owns a Mexican baseball team, Tigres de Quintana Roo. Big difference to be a player, regular player, and, uh, and own one team because uh, just, uh, you know, he has to think in uh, different, different things. It's fun because it's, I'm still in baseball and I think that's, that's what I like to, um, to be, you know, in a, in a baseball field. It's been 40 years, but Valenzuela remains frozen in our collective memory as a pudgy 20-year-old pitcher from Echoaquila, Mexico, who beguiled batters and brought a sense of pride and inclusion to LA's Latino community. There's a reason why they called it Fernando Mania. Uh, you know, my all-time favorite uh, pitcher is uh, Sandy Koufax, in no small part because I grew up in a Jewish community and my mother was so proud when he refused uh, to play on the Sabbath, you know, out of this strong sense of faith. And of course, he was also a sensation over a long period of time. There's no question that fairly quickly, uh, Fernando became my other favorite uh, Dodger. The, the pride that, that, that we all felt uh, growing up on the east side and seeing someone like us playing baseball at a really high level. The fact that, you know, he's a baseball player, that he's a Dodger, that he is successful, that we could point with pride that we have one of our own in this kind of amazing role. Those are very, very significant images to the Latino community because there's not enough of them. And he was humble and he was one of them. So it brought it all together and it just made us proud. And like I said, it was like having someone from the family be in that kind of position. There was a, a real closeness from our community. So many people have not met Fernando. They, they've only had an opportunity to see him in the stadium or, or on TV, but they feel like he's part of their family and they're very proud of that. I have a, a, a moment in my family where it was my father my uncle, and it was my cousins. It was all men, and we were watching, uh, we were at a Dodger game, 
And Fernando comes out, and I remember looking at uh, my father. My father was teary-eyed, and it meant so much, right? And I think it was, Fernando was a symbol of the thing that brought my family together. I, it's almost like silly now when I think about it, but uh, I think it was a really big moment to see all of that, uh, all foreignness come together over something we could for once agree on. The bleachers that used to be mostly uh, white, um, mostly uh, fraternities and things like that, uh, uh, became more and more brown. And so did the upper deck. I remember when I first started up there, it was basically white. There's just a bunch of dudes with serapes up in the upper decks. And then eventually people began to get into the reserve section that were brown. First of all, Los Angeles is, is we do, like we have stars. I don't think at the time when Fernando was, was, was pitching, I don't think there was a bigger star. I don't think there's been one. Fernando, when he came aboard, he was the guy. Fernando brought neighborhoods together. And Fernando Mania lives on in the broadcast booth, where Valenzuela calls Dodgers games with fellow legend Jaime Harin. I was very fortunate to be with the Dodgers when he came in 1980, and I went there to greet him. But I noticed that now a little bit he's more open now. Before he was very quiet, didn't talk much. But now he, he is more relaxed, more open. Well, he has been with us for so many years, so I think he is very comfortable with us. As long as Fernando's in that booth calling the Spanish language games, we are still writing a good part of the Fernando Mania wave. Fernando made change baseball. I mean, Jackie Robinson changed baseball, but he, he changed it in terms of racially. But Fernando changed it not only in terms of racially or ethnically, but culturally in terms of language. He connected Mexico. Fernando made baseball an international, an international sport. I mean, at least in the Spanish-speaking world. I believe that Fernando will always be a hero to the Mexican-American community. People love him. To this day, they love him. You root for the underdog. And so when Fernando came in, it's like, I think it was in our DNA. He's an underdog, you know, because he's coming from Sonora. He's coming from the Mexican League. But we're going to root for him because we want to see this guy be successful. We want him to achieve his goals. We need somebody that we can tell a kid that's got the goods, look at what this guy did. And you kind of mentor him through those programs and you point them towards these guys that came from nothing and achieved so much. And look at, we're still talking about him today. It's, it's still alive. The pride is still there. The Fernando jerseys are still there. The veteranos and the veteranas hanging on are still there. Oh my God, so the feeling now about Fernando is Fernando is the uncle that made good, right? He is the relative who is still forever a superstar. He's immortalized, you know, he's the Maria Felix of sports. I tell him, you know, uh, it's unbelievable that after all this, people, everywhere I go with you, people love you. People are still after you and, and, and look at Fernando everywhere we're at and to him, it's just, mm, 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 oh well, he goes, yeah, they're, because the ones that remember me, that forgot me already, they're, uh, they're so old, you know. But I go, nope, nope, you're mistaken. Everywhere you go, people respect you. After 40 years, the people still remember things and games. And even when I go in Mexico, the people, they still talking about few games. Like I say, I don't even remember those games, but they, they, they say, okay, in this day, you do this and that, and that's great, you know, when after Many years, some fans, people are still talking about, the, about those years. You know? It's an L.A. story. I honestly believe that it's part of the history of Los Angeles. That's the impact that he had, not just on the Latino community. And I think every ethnic group was, was wearing Fernando jersey. You know, everybody, because he was the guy.